What's up, Resonate? Good to see you guys. We are rolling in our context of our sermon series called Squad Goals. And so this is our last, uh, our last time to be able to get into this. And along the way, the, over the last few weeks, we have really pressed into this, uh, this really important relationship called friendships. And as we think through what it looks like for friendships, we need to understand, hey, we have a deep need for this. Like every single one of us have a deep need to figure out, hey, what does it look like for me to live into my friendships, to be able to be able to be connected and to be able to know that that is something that we desire and we've been created for. But as we begin to think through that from a biblical perspective, what gives us the motivation to be friends? And as we, last week we talked about, what does it look like when we have tension and we have conflict? How do we get, begin to move into that so we actually get connected together. And so this is just massive as we begin to press forward and be able to say, what does God intend for our friendships? And what, is this, what does this look like? Um, there's a guy named uh, Jason Witten, um, and Jason Witten used to play for uh, the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, as he uh, w- moved throughout his career, uh, a year ago, he retired. And when he retired, um, basically what they did is they took and said, hey, we want to celebrate you, Jason. We want to celebrate your, uh, your context for your, your career. And by doing that, what we want to do is we want to set up a moment for you to be able to say, hey, this was one of the defining plays of my career. And one of the defining plays of his career, he he uses this basically a moment to be able to describe a time where he scored a touchdown. And typically what happens when the Dallas Cowboys honor uh, someone who's had a long tenure and is retiring, they they take and they focus this moment and they begin to celebrate. And this person basically says, hey, this is uh, is the defining moment of my career. This is the the pinnacle. This represents all that I stood for as uh, as an NFL player. And in this, uh, he takes again this play and he begins to, uh, he shows it and um, obviously it's a, it's a big moment in, in his career. It's a big moment for the Dallas Cowboys. Um, but what he does is he gets up there and he begins to do something that really no one expected. As he begins to unpack and um, kind of expand and, and help to, to clarify what this was all about and begin to dissect the play, what, what Jason Witten does uh, as, as a tight end is he begins to describe how everyone else played a role in this. So he begins to talk about um, the movement of the offensive line to be able to not only prov- provide protection, but to be able to block um, certain people. He begins to talk about the other receivers and what they had to do to be able to create the, the necessary expansion of the field so that he would have the space be it, to be able to take this. He begins to talk about the people who blocked downfield from him to be able to say, hey, this is, this is what happens. And he goes through, he talks about Tony, Tony Romo, his, his quarterback, and how um, he, he delivered the the perfect ball just like over the course of his career he had a habit of doing and what Jason Witten does is he takes and he begins to to use his entire time not to talk about himself not to talk about um, this as an accomplishment that he did but he takes and he begins to show how everyone else had a role in making that successful and all he had to do is catch the ball and run into the end zone and it was that kind of clarity that in that moment as he had his teammates gathered around um, and they begin to describe the moment um, there was tears throughout this locker room grown large men with tears in their eyes as they began to understand what Jason Witten was trying to say about his teammates and, uh, and, and it was so clear as, uh, as his head coach began to describe, he said, this is just who Jason is. This is just what he did over the course of his career. He began to point the spotlight to everyone else. And in this, this is so key because what happens when, him, uh, when he left the team, it's just, he was such a beloved person in that because that is how he lived uh, his life. And that be, it began to reflect how he began to orient towards the rest of the people in his life. And I think as we look at this, this idea that Jason Witten shows is this key understanding for us as we move into this last part of squad goals and what it means for us to press into this idea of friendship. Friendship. Now, when we think about friendship, friendship is this relationship that we tend to neglect, and yet is the most influential relationship in our life. Really, our friends point to who we will become. And so we've said it before, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. And that is such a key thing because of the influence that we have on each other. And so in this, 
why is this something that we tend to neglect? It's, it's because in every culture, no matter what culture it is, we tend to put friendship on the back burner. So in individualistic or liberal cultures, it begins to be, the, the focus is on, it's, it's on the individual, it's on our personal desires. And so the relationship that gets promoted in that is sexual or erotic kind of relationships. And so this is what draws our attention and this is what draws our, our focus. And so when we think about marketing, when we begin to think about what changes our behavior, right? The, the phrase that we use, sex, Excels. And so our, our focus and, and then the change of our behaviors is to be able to point towards that aspect of a relationship, to be able to say, hey, this is what begins to draw my attention. There's much less, if you think about movies, there has to be a romantic part of this movie. They can't just have a movie about friendship because that would be boring. And so there has to be a love interest. And so they have to build this in. And so in this, this is what our culture begins to put the focus on in terms of how, what changes our behavior or what draws our interest. When you think about traditional or conservative cultures, the focus there in that relationship is on the family. And so the family dynamic becomes the thing that motivates. And so how I feel about my family, the the motivation towards being able to honor my family and to be able to align myself with what my family does, that's what puts the social pressure on us to be able to have um, our behaviors change. In societies that it's about um, uh, 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 socialistic cultures, it is about your civic relationship and it's about the power dynamics and you and the people that you live around and how you interact with those people. And that's the main thing. And that's the thing that changes your behavior. But in every single culture, what happens is we begin to see friendship pressed to the side because in every culture, friendship will be put on the back burner because it's, it doesn't have a biological necessity to it. It's the, mo- it's the least instinctual of all the things. We don't need it for survival, really, in terms of how we move about our, our lives. And in this, everything else that will push, those behavioral relationships will push themselves on you. But in, when it comes to friendship, this is the thing that we have to move towards intentionally. This is the thing that we have to make deliberate or else it will be pushed out of our life. And as we begin to look at this and as we begin to understand it, here's what we have to see. We have to see a God who modeled this for us. And what we, as people who understand uh, historical Orthodox Christianity, and we are people that are aligned to the Bible, the God of the Bible is a God that we call a Trinitarian God or a Trinitarian theology, which means it's God in in three persons, one being in three persons. It's a crazy idea. But one of the key things about this is that it illustrates the the community that God himself shares with himself. It's kind of a bizarre idea, but what you see is this sense of being able to have interplay and to be able to have this reality of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And one of the key things about this that we begin to see that helps us to understand how we're to move towards each other is really understanding God in the form of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit we see in the Bible is this person who comes alongside, who's this person who empowers, this person that brings about uh, our our ability to accomplish and to live in what we're called to live in. This is this powerful, powerful, powerful idea that God brings his Holy Spirit in order to allow his people to be able to live into the relationship and expand and and, and to be able to accomplish what he's called them to do. And so when we think about this and we begin to understand this, it really points us to what a friendship looks like in terms of the Bible and in terms of us being people that orient our lives around spirituality. And to do that, and to be able to help us to understand this, because it's kind of a bizarre idea, and it's definitely countercultural. I want us to look at a, a friendship in the Bible. And this is maybe the most uh, famous friendship in the Bible. And it's a friendship between a guy named David, King David, who um, a lot of the Bible's around a pivotal figure when it comes to how God orients and how God works his, uh, his, his plan out in the world. And a guy named Jonathan, David and Jonathan. And in 1 Samuel 20, um, chapter 20, we, we begin to see kind of this picture of their relationship together and a picture of this friendship. And I want us to take, and, and we can talk sometimes about um, these ideas of friendship, and we can talk about these concepts of friendship, but today I really want to look at a tangible picture of really how we begin to have the kind of friends that change our lives, the kind of friends that, that say, I'm not the same kind of person because of you. 
the, the kind of people that begin to say, if you are in my life, there would be a void. There would be a trajectory change. There would be something that was missing. And I think that that is the kind of friends that we want. And that's the kind of friends that we have been created for. And so First, Sir, First Samuel chapter 20, we're going to get into this. It's a bit of a crazy story. So let me give you a little bit of background. So get as if we just dive in, it's going to be really hard to understand. So here's the background of this. God chooses a group of people called the, called the Israelites. And what he does is he begins to say, I want you to be able to reveal to the world something very specific. And, and, and this is not just a, uh, like a deistic God and just God of everything. God begins to say, hey, there's something very specific that I, that I want you to do, understand that God is specific, he's noble, he's findable, he's intentional, and he needs people who are faithful to something specific. He needs leaders. And so he chooses people to bear his message. And these people get it right sometimes. These people get it wrong sometimes. But this group of people operates differently than anyone else. And, and, and they operate in a way that is oriented around God. But they look around and they begin to see the way that other people begin to interact. And they begin to see other, um, uh, other nations. And they begin to have these kings. And they say, God, we want... We want a king. And God says, man, I've given you my, my law. I've given you the ways. And they're like, no, that's not tangible. We want someone. And he said, I'm someone. No, we want someone we can see. We want someone who we can look at. We want someone who we can follow. And God finally begins to say, okay, I'm gonna give you what you asked for, but it's not the best thing for you. And this is a fascinating thing as we understand the grace of God. And so he gives him a guy named Saul. Now Saul is everything that they wanted. He is the guy who is tall. He is the warrior. He is the good looking dude. He's the guy who checks all the boxes on, we want a king just like everyone else has a king. And so Saul, Saul fits that, that thing. So Saul is anointed the king. Now Saul has deep, deep flaws in terms of his leadership. And so what happens is God says, hey, I'm not gonna allow your line to continue and I'm gonna find someone else. And so he sends this, the, the Samuel, the prophet, to be able to go find the next king. And so he, Samuel says, I know it's one of the sons of Jesse. And so Jesse brings all of his sons except for one to go meet Samuel. And Samuel looks at them all and says, there must be a mistake because there's no king here. And he says to Jesse, is there any other son that you have? And he says, well, I have the youngest, he's out watching the sheep. He's like, take me, to, take me to this last son. And that happens to be David. And David is, the, is crowned, or it's anointed the next king. Now, it's an already, but not yet. He's already gonna be the next king, and yet Saul is not dead yet. And so in this, there becomes this, this point of tension. We begin to see the, um, the beginnings of David's escapades as he begins to have uh, this moment with Goliath with the, that he becomes famous. But ultimately what happens is he begins to enter into the king's house because he plays the harp and, and Saul's a stressed out dude and he needs some harp playing. And so, um, so he begins to enter into this and immediately Saul begins to see David as a threat. So he begins to orchestrate these moments to be able to send David out into very, very sketchy situations thinking that, okay, he's gonna get killed. And it's just, it's just crazy. You should read about it because I, I just can't tell you about the, the specific things that are mind-blowing things um, that ultimately David accomplishes in order to be able to, uh, to stay and to be able to have these crazy stories about him and his dominance as a warrior. And he begins to have this legend that grows and Saul's jealousy grows at the same rate as David's fame. And here we have this moment where he is in the context of being uh, kind of living in the, in the midst of the, of the king and the king's son, Jonathan. So you have Saul and Jonathan and you have David and there begins to be tension. And that's where we begin to get in chapter 20 of First Samuel. It says this, now David fled from Nioth to Ramah and found Jonathan. What have I done? He exclaims. He exclaimed, what is my crime? How have I offended your father that he is so determined to kill me? That's not true, Jonathan protested. You're not going to die. He always tells me everything he's going to do, even the little things. I know my father wouldn't hide something like this from me. It just isn't so. Then David took an oath before Jonathan and said, your father knows perfectly well about our friendship. So he has said to himself, I won't tell Jonathan. Why should I hurt him? But I swear to you that I'm only one step away from death. I swear it by the Lord and by your own soul. 
tell me what I can do to help you, Jonathan exclaimed. This is, this is an, 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 incredible, um, an incredible response of friendship in this. David replied, tomorrow we celebrate the new moon festival. I've always eaten with the king on this occasion, but tomorrow I, I'll hide in the field and stay there until the evening of the third day. If your father asks me where I am, tell him I ask permission to go home to Bethlehem for an annual family sacrifice. If he says, fine, you'll know that all is well. But if he is angry and loses his temper, you'll know that he is determined to kill me. Show me this loyalty as my sworn friend, for we made a solemn pact before the Lord, or kill me yourself if I've sinned against your father. But please don't betray me to him. Never, Jonathan exclaimed. You know that if I had the slightest notion that my father was planning to kill you, I would tell you at once. Then David asked, how will I know whether, your father's a- whether or not your father's angry? Come out to the field with me, Jonathan replied. And they went out together. Then Jonathan told David, I promise by the Lord, the God of Israel, that by this time tomorrow or the next day at the latest, I will talk to my father and let you know at once how he feels about you. And if he speaks favorably you, about you, I will let you know. But if he is angry and wants, to, wants you killed, may the Lord strike me and even kill me if I don't warn you so that you can escape and live. May the Lord be with you as he used to be with my father and may you treat me with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. But if I die, treat my family with this faithful love, even when the Lord destroys all your enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a solemn pact with David saying, may the Lord destroy all of your enemies. And Jonathan made David reaffirm his vow of friendship again for Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. So here's what happens. They, dis, they devise a plan to be able to say, hey, here's the signal, all right? So the next little bit, we're gonna skip to forward to verse 24. They, they figure out, okay, this is how I'm gonna show you whether or not my father saw is going to be angry at you or not. So David hid himself in a field. And when the new moon festival began, the king sat down to eat. He sat at his usual place against the wall with Jonathan sitting opposite him and Abner beside him. But David's place was empty. Saul didn't say anything about it that day, for he said to himself, something must have made David ceremonial, ceremonially unclean. But when David's place was empty again the next day, Saul asked Jonathan, why hasn't the son of Jesse been here for the meal either yesterday or today? Jonathan replied, David earnestly asked me if he could go to Bethlehem. He said, please let me go, for we are having a family sacrifice. My brother demanded that I be there, so please let me get away to see my brothers. And that's why he isn't here at the king's table. Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan, who evidently wasn't a very good liar. You stupid son of a whore, he swore at him. Now you're like, okay, this is interesting. Okay, I'm just, I was, I was kind of, you know, all that was kind of, what, you know, crazy, but uh, now, I'm, now I'm paying attention. He swore at him. Do you not know that you want him to be king? Uh, or do you not think that I don't know that you want him to be king in your place, shaming yourself and your mother? As long as the son of Jesse is alive, you'll never be king. Now go and get him so I can kill him. But why should he be put to death? Jonathan asked his father. What has he done? Then Saul hurled a spear at Jonathan, intending to kill him. Then CPS came and got Jonathan out of there, right? So at last, Jonathan realized that his father was really determined to kill David. You think your family's messed up. You're like, all of a sudden, man, I'm reading some stuff in the Bible, and now I realize that we're not nearly as dysfunctional as I thought. It's been rare that my father's hurled spears at me, right? Um, and so this is, this is this crazy moment, right? So Jonathan left the table in fierce anger and refused to eat on that second day of the festival, for he was crushed by his father's shameful behavior towards David. I want you to get that, that sense of the emotion that's there for his friend. The next morning, as he agreed, Jonathan went out into the field and took a young boy with him to gather his arrows. Start running, he told the boy, so that you can find the arrows as I shoot them, which seems a little dangerous, right? Run, I'm gonna shoot the arrows towards you. <clears throat> Long time ago, rules are different. Um, Start running so that you can find the arrows as I shoot them, he told. Uh, So the boy ran and Jonathan shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy had almost reached the arrow, Jonathan shouted, the arrow is still ahead of you. Hurry, hurry, don't wait. So the boy gathered up the arrows and ran back to his master. He, of course, suspected nothing. Only Jonathan and David understood the signal. Then Jonathan gave his bow and the arrows to the boy and told him to take them back to town. 
As soon as the boy was gone, David came out from where he'd been hiding near the stone pile. Then David bowed three times to Jonathan with his face to the ground. Both of them were in tears as they embraced each other and said goodbye, especially David. At last, Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn loyalty to each other in the Lord's name. The Lord is the witness of a bond between us and our children forever. Then David left and Jonathan returned to the town. Now, as, as far as we understand, uh, this is their last moment together. And this is, this is the last moment that they see each other. Eventually, Jonathan is killed in battle and eventually David goes on to become king. And in this, what we begin to see is this, this picture of this picture of friendship is so profound and this picture of friendship is so significant that we begin to see this tangible idea of what this deep kind of connection between friends really looks like. And so I want to just highlight a couple of things so that we can begin to say, hey, what is this what does this look like? And, and how do we begin to press in and understand how we can begin to live towards this? Because there's a couple of things that I think if we miss them, we can begin to say, that's an interesting story. But I want you to understand that this is a story that you can live out too. And this is the kind of friendship that is available to you if you understand just a, a few key elements. So I just want us to see a, a few core L or a couple of core elements of friendship. The first one is this, is this idea of safety in this what you see is all around them, there is, there's just craziness going on, right? There's spear throwing and threatens of death. And, um, and in, in the midst of this, in the midst of a dangerous situation, in the midst of a stressful situation, in the midst of stuff that's going on that, uh, that's not as they desire, is not as they, as they want, there's a sense where they find in, in each other, they find in this friendship a sense of safety. They, f- they find a sense of stability. They find a sense of being able to let their guard down when everything else around them is pressing in on them. And in this, this is so profound because we get, we get to see really what it looks looks like in the context of friendship for people to find places of safety. Now, I want you to get that we are all hardwired to migrate towards moments or to migrate to environments of acceptance. That, that in us, there is, a, uh, there is a desire for us to be able to move towards relationships that are fully accepting of, of who we are. And that as we begin to do this, this is one of the key things that as you begin to figure out the, the kind of the constellation of your friends and to figure out what it looks like is that we move towards people who are safe. And, and this is something that is, is absolutely key for us because when we begin to think about um, how, like how we're wired, we want to be around people that we can be ourselves around, people that we can operate in and, and be able to say, this is just authentically me. This is a place where, where, I, where I am who I am and I'm accepted in this way. And what happens in this is that this acceptance leads to influence. And when we begin to think about, about this, we need to understand that, that there's a place of safety that includes some, some key elements. And when we think about this, this is what creates great friendships, is this idea of this, these are safe people. And so safety is this, it's truth plus grace plus commitment. And so it's not just, safe people aren't just nice people. Safe people aren't just people who blindly say, hey, whatever, because at at some point you begin to say, I'm not sure if, if you actually see me, like, I'm not actually sure if you're a safe person, if you're letting me get into contexts that are, um, are detrimental uh, to, to this. And so it's, it's people who speak truth. If, if you've ever been around someone who so wants to uh, not cause any rift or that they don't speak truth to you, there's not, there's not honesty in that. At some point you're like, hey, if you're not gonna speak truth to me, if it's only about the, the good things, like it's actually not a safe place. And sometimes we're scared to be able to say like truthful things to each other because we think it's gonna fracture the safety, but we need to understand that it is truth plus grace. Grace meaning this, that, that you begin to say, hey, I'm operating in the realistic version of you, not the idealistic version of you. And that we begin to say, okay, I'm not gonna expect something of you that is not realistic. And so this, this is this different. People who are filled with grace expect realistic things. 
And then this idea of being able to have commitment to each other, saying, hey, I'm not just gonna be a fair weather friend. I'm gonna be here when things are good and I'm gonna be here when things are not good. And these are the moments that are really profound to us when we begin to have people speaking, speaking truth, um, being able to be people of grace, being able to be a people of commitment that allows you to have the kind of friendship that you just feel deeply at home in and I want you to get when you find something like that and your soul feels at rest, look for those things. Find that. Find those kind of friends. And when you do, it's a life-changing event. It, it, it does. And here's why it's a life-changing event. Because acceptance leads to influence. Acceptance leads to influence. Now, I want to just really quick give you a, a caveat to this. That acceptance leads to influence, which could, act, could be one of the most significant points of success in your life or one of the most difficult aspects of your life as well, depending on where your friends are going to influence you. Because acceptance leads to influence and because we always migrate to places of acceptance, what happens is that your friends become the really point to your future, right? They become the most significant thing. When you're young, really, here's the two environments. When you're young, your parents are the most significant influence. And the, and the trajectory of your life is, is kind of captured around how your, how your parents influence you. But there's a moment that it moves from your parents' influence to your friends' influence. And now the one thing that I can say about you and I can say about me is that your future is most clearly seen in the company that you keep. Your friends determine your future because acceptance leads to influence. Influence affects our trajectory. If you look at your friends, you can begin to look at your future. And this is potentially a great thing, but it's also, I need to just really clearly say to you, choose your friends wisely. Choose your friends wisely. There's all kinds of things that you begin to see happen when you begin to see, man, things that I would have never considered okay. As I begin to see the constellation of my friends doing this, I begin to have this drift. I see people who graduate from college and whatever they had expectations of, all of a sudden they begin to see their friends getting bigger and better and living this upgrade life. And all of a sudden they're like, man, my house isn't good enough. My car isn't good enough. My vacations aren't good enough. And they begin to have this moment where they begin to shift and say, man, I want to be able to, have all these things and it becomes okay because they see all their friends doing it. And the same thing, the choices that you make on weekends, the choices that you make in terms of you and what you get engaged in, these are oftentimes connected to the kind of friends that you have. And in this, they have influence and they begin to determine your future. So don't, don't, don't fall for the lie that you self-determine all of your things. That is that is a lie. You are, you are less in control of your future independently than you think you are. You are connected, and it's subtle, but you're connected to the people that you have company around. And those are the kind of people that begin to traje- give you trajectory to your life. And it's so subtle, you'll begin to see yourself beginning to morph. And at first, your conscience will be there. But at some point, you'll be able to say, I guess that's just normal. Safety. This is the part, as we begin to think, what does it look like? Not only safety, you see this, but support. And this is the idea that comes from um, what we see in uh, Jonathan as he begins to say, I'm not going to point towards myself. I'm going to point towards David. And and this is the key thing. As, As you see this, man, what is Saul most angry about? Saul is most angry that Jonathan is leveraging his leadership towards David's future at the cost of his own. Jonathan is up to be the next king and Saul cannot comprehend how Jonathan begins to point towards supporting David and understanding what David's calling is at the cost of his own. But I want you to understand, this is, this, this is what makes this relationship so um, so deeply, deeply fulfilling and so deeply, deeply famous because we begin to see what it looks like for someone to say, I see God at work in your life and I'm gonna point towards this. 
that, that, that what we begin to see from Jonathan is this, this person who begins to say, I see what God is up to and I want to support that. I see what, what you're called to be and what I want to do is I want, you to help, I want to help you begin to become this kind of person. And so we see this person who is destined to become a king, right? In terms of the cultural thing, set that aside to be able to help his friend to be able to navigate who he's called to be. And I want you to get that this kind of sacrifice, when you begin to have this kind of sacrifice in the very beginning, this seems like it doesn't make any sense. But when you begin to operate in terms of support and sacrifice for something else, there's something that happens in, the, in the, just the inside of someone else, whenever you are sacrificed for, whenever someone uh, begins to live towards you and you begin to see that they are doing something that's not in their own interest, but in your interest, it's, it's a profound experience. If you've ever had this moment where you begin to see someone sacrifice their things that might be for their best good, for your best good, it'll wreck your life. It'll change what you think about humanity. I, I'm telling you, it's that deep of a thing. That this is one of those things that it is, it is not just a gift, but it is an investment. Because when you begin to live sacrificially towards other people, that begins to happen in a way that comes back to you. It's like spinning this flywheel. It's hard at the very beginning, but when it happens, it begins to be something that you begin to be the, this, this person that just beautifies other people's life in a really significant way and it always comes back to be a blessing to you as well but this is the key as we understand this Jonathan believed in who David was so significantly that he sacrificed him he sacrificed to help him become that kind of person and to become and to be able to help him become become who God's called him to be and this is this is a powerful powerful friendship moment and this is the moment as we begin to see stories like the Lord of the Rings, that, that this whole idea is oriented around. That, that the Lord of the Rings is about a friendship, but it's about a certain kind of moment in friendship, a certain kind of friendship where you begin to see someone who says, hey, my goal is to help you to accomplish your thing. So you begin to see this group of people that is helping Frodo to be able to accomplish this mission that he has. And you begin to recognize that there's no way that Frodo could accomplish this without the work of his friends. But I want you to understand this is a principle of, of life. This is a principle of this reality that you cannot be who you're called to be without the people around you. That we're far too individualistic that you need somebody around you that can help you to become who you've been called to be. And this is this, this beautiful moment of friendship. Whenever we begin to say, okay, how do we begin to be people that are connected to safety and we begin to be, have people that are connected to be able to have environments of acceptance? And how do we become people that help, uh, that we find people that, that help us to be able to say, hey, I need people around me to become who God's called me to be. And just as clear as, as, clear as I can say it, you can't be who God's called you to be without friends. And so here's the temptation that we begin to say, man, I, I, I totally buy into that. And I want, I want friends that I can really be myself around. And I want to find somebody who can be that kind of friend to me. That I, that I need friends, Keith. I, I need friends that help me to accomplish all that God's called me to be. That if I'm going somewhere, that help me to get there. And that's the normative way for us to think, hey, we need to upgrade our friends. We need a friend upgrade. And we have a vision for that. But here's what I want to, to challenge us. That as we think about what we're called to be, instead of being able to say, how do I find a Jonathan? I think the question that ultimately brings us into the best way that we could possibly live is to ask, how do I find a David? The question isn't, how do I find a Jonathan? But how do I find a David? How do I find a David? Who is in my life that I can commit to and understands that I'm a safe person for them? And this is this understanding of being able to say, who is it that I can begin to say, how can I reveal to them and accept you in who you are? How is it that I can begin to operate out of this? And here's the key, is that it's unlikely that you can do this unless there's something in your life that's helping you to understand the safety that God has given you. 
that most of the time people who don't feel like they're accepted have a hard time beginning to communicate success or acceptance to other people. So there has to be something external that begins to allow you to operate in that kind of depth of friendship. And number two, what if, what if one of the things on earth that you're called to accomplish is to help other people achieve who God's called them to be? What if you're here and it's about helping other people to achieve what God's called them to achieve? And that might seem like, hey man, this is this giving thing, but when you begin to understand what the Holy Spirit's operating in your life and you begin to see hey, God, is, God is helping you to become that person so that you can become that person to someone else, that, that begins to have a motivation that comes external to you. So interestingly enough, Jason Witten, after he retired, took a year off. Today, he came back and played his first game again for the Dallas Cowboys. He came out of retirement to come back and be a part of this team. And today the commentators were talking about this. And they're talking about the moment when, uh, when, the, when the team came on the field and they're talking about uh, all, these, all these guys that were getting recognized and the roars, there's a lot of superstars on the Dallas Cowboys, but the roars were overwhelming, not for the other superstars, but when Jason Witten was announced at the game, it's like the whole stadium lost its mind for a 37-year-old tight end. And he didn't just get on the game, you know, in there for spot, um, for spot play, but today he scored a touchdown. 37-year-old Jason Witten coming out of retirement scored a touchdown. And I want you to get what happened after that how all those guys swarmed him. The moment when Jason Garrett and he locked eyes and he came up and the, and the kind of moment that began to share uh, between those two showed something special. Something special about a guy who pointed the spotlight to everyone else. I want you to know it was the guy who when the spotlight was turned on him, shined to other people and shined it so brightly on everyone else. That's the guy who, who everyone loved. That's the guy who began to attract this massive support. And I want you to get the true heroes are the ones who make other people the hero. And that's the kind of friends that we need to become. What I wanna do is I wanna turn it over to your site pastor to talk through how do you make that into a practical reality and how do you begin to have something that fuels that from the inside out so that you can become those kind of friends. That Jason Witten story really uh, troubles me because I am 37 years old. Uh, in a in a <laughs> in a couple weeks, and uh, I get injured like pouring cereal into a bowl. It's like it's like it's like a full bowl injures me. Uh, that's that's the age I am. Injured during breakfast. Uh, he's out there catching touchdowns. Uh, the temptation we have anytime you listen to a sermon is to uh, is to think, okay, my application, like what I'm supposed to do now, if you're anything like me, is uh, you'll think I need to try harder. And, and we have to make sure that we as a church, when we talk about applying something, is that we make sure we tell you who you are while you're doing something, not just what to do. So for instance, last, you know, when we started the series, we're like, hey, uh, pick a village and then, you know, just don't Pick who you hang out with in village, but be friends in village. You're like, okay, got it. I'll try really hard to be friends with someone I'm not usually friends with. Got it. Okay, last week, conflict. Okay, got it. Uh, I'm going to conflict with someone this week, but be healthy and be cool about it, right? Uh, okay, got it. Awesome. Okay, what's this week? Find a David. Okay, which one of you guys named David? Anybody cool? Like, how do you apply it? Like, seriously, though. Like, and then you go to church a lot and you're like, every week I just go and he tell, they tell me something else to do. And it's like from the Bible, so I better do it, right? And, and what that can do is it can create a tension in us that we have to talk about. Like, we've got to get our identity settled or this application stuff just turns into a list 
that, that misunderstands the whole thing. So what's your motivation to hang out with someone you wouldn't naturally hang out with? What's your motivation to have conflict with someone uh, when conflict's not easy? What's your motivation to look at one of your friends and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support your calling. I'm going to be there for you and self-sacrifice for you. Like what in the world would motivate you to that kind of life? Because if we could get you motivated, then we think you would actualize this stuff on your own. And so uh, what, what, what motivates us and what we are drawn to uh, is an invitation, uh, an invitation that is so profound and so life-altering and so reorienting that if you get it, if you say yes to this invitation, everything else falls into place. And that invitation is found in John chapter 15, uh, starting in verse 12, where, where Jesus tells this to his disciples. And uh, we, we, we pick up and, and saying it to them, he's, he's in turn knowing that it would be ultimately said to us. So he says this, my command is this, Love each other as I've loved you. And greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Here's the key. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends and, and, and everything that I've learned from the father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last and so that whatever you ask in, in my name, the Father will give you. So, so here's, the, here's the tension. Jesus says in this passage, you're my friends if you do what I command. That's a pretty intense statement from Jesus. You're my friend, me and you are cool, but only if you do what I command. If you have any other friend like that in your life, stop being friends with them. If you have a friend that's like, hey, we're cool, but you have to obey me. You're like, that's abusive and not okay. Run away. Tell your village leader. If it's your village leader, tell a staff member. If it's a staff member, tell me. If it's, it's not me, okay? Uh, <laughs> tell that. <laughs> not okay. It's only okay to tell someone, obey me, if you created the world and you created them and you've never sinned and you know what's best for the whole earth. And that's Jesus. So he's loving when he says, do what I command. But here's the tension that creates. It sounds like Jesus is saying, if you... If you obey my commands, I love you. It sounds like what he's saying is you must work for my love. That sounds like what Jesus is saying. You have to work for my love. So you go out there and find a David. And if you do that, then you come back to me and you go, hey, uh, Jesus did what the pastor told me. I found a David. So are we cool now? You love me? It can feel like that. There's a transactional nature to this text. And here's what it does. It makes you look at all the times you didn't obey his commands. And it makes you think, therefore, he must not love me. If you're anything like me, you're like, man, if Jesus says you obey your commands, I'll love you. Then man, like today, like on my way here, like I disobeyed his commands. So I must have come into church today looking at Jesus like, man, he doesn't love me. I break his commands all the time. And listen, I know that you are a college student, so you have a higher propensity to sin than other people. You know, like awkward laughs, right? <laughs> yeah, like you're super sinful, right? some commandment breakers in the crowd. And here's the temptation. What are you going to do with that commandment breaker? What are you going to do? You're going to go, well, I guess Jesus doesn't love me. You know what will make him love me? If I go to church, then he'll love me. If I do good, he'll love me. If I, you know, act right, he'll love me. Um, and so let's, let's just do a little pretend test for a moment. I, I want to see if you can imagine uh, what, where you really stand on this, like Jesus's love for you based on your commands. So here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to trust me for a second and just close your eyes with me. Close your eyes. No one's going to steal your purse. I hope. Got some commandment breakers out there, so who knows? <laughs> Clutch your purse. Close your eyes. Stay with me. So close your eyes, and here's what I want you to do. Use your imagination. Don't get weird. Use your imagination. I want you to picture God the Father. He's on a throne, whatever you picture. You picture God, and you picture Jesus. So when you start to imagine them, um, they're looking at you. In, in, this, in this picture. And I want you to imagine when they look at you, when Jesus looks at you, what does his facial expression say? Does he look disappointed? Are his arms crossed? Is he bummed out? 
Does he see your shame? Does he see your commandment breaking? Does he see your sin? What do you picture when you when you see him? How do you feel in his presence? Do you feel safe and secure and bought, paid for, or do you feel unworthy, ashamed? As you're face down, like what are you picturing? Okay, open your eyes and look back at me for a second. The way you think about this commandment breaking love thing defines what you think about God, which then defines like what kind of religion you're even talking about. So, so here's what I mean. If you think you've got to earn his love, then you're in a different, con- you're not even in Christianity anymore. You're in another world religion. I've got to earn God's love. But if you can look at this and say, uh, no, 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 that's not the picture at all, then you have a chance to realizing this. <clears throat> the only chance you have to obey his commands, the only chance you have to obey his commands is realizing that he chose you and he loves you and he calls you his friend while you were a commandment breaker. The only chance you have to obey his commands and have the motivation and the joy and the stirring to go forward as a, as a person trying to obey Jesus is realizing that when you didn't obey Jesus, he chose you and he loved you and he called you his friend. And so, so listen, stop trying to earn what he's trying to give you. Stop trying to earn what Jesus is trying to freely give you. Stop trying to earn the approval that Jesus earned for you. He's called you his friend. You're not a servant anymore. You're not a slave anymore. He's called you his friend. And that invitation stands. And if we get that, everything else will fall into place.